We are in Route 66 tonight and uh, looking at the book of Micah. And so hopefully you have your Bibles open to Micah already. It follows Jonah, if you, you weren't aware of that. So uh, if you find Jonah, most people know where Jonah is. Just look for Micah, which is right next to it. And uh, why don't we open with prayer? Father, we thank you so much. Uh, for this night. Thank you for this book that you have given us. Thank you for this prophet that you called um, from an unexpected place, really, but declared your word. And Father, I pray that we would take heart to message the message that you gave him to um, Israel and Judah. Help us take heart as well, that we would walk humbly with you in sincerity and true worship. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, what happens when God's people don't act like God's people? Well, that means God's going to do something about it, right? God's going to act. And we've said it before and and actually titled the message tonight, we can either be humble or we can be humbled. Now, let me give you a little grammar lesson, okay? One of those uh, phrases is in the active voice. The other is in the passive voice, okay, grammatically speaking. Active is what we're doing, the action we take. Passive is in either an action we receive or something that's done to us or taken against us. So you can be humble or you can be humbled. God calls us to act in humility of heart according to his word. And when we don't, he'll often take steps to humble us and shake us out of our pride. And, of course, the end result is often the same. But the process of getting there is a lot more difficult in one than in the other. Now, in the case of the, the northern kingdom of Israel, uh, God's people chose a more difficult path. And they would have to be humbled by the God that they had long abandoned. They chose in that path of pride and of wickedness, oppression, so they themselves would be oppressed. They would experience great wickedness against them. And just like God had, as we've seen many times before, had to bring in the Babylonians to punish uh, the, the southern kingdom, God promised to bring in the Assyrians to prom, uh, against the northern kingdom and punish them. In fact, it was those Assyrians that would come first. And that was supposed to really serve as a stern example to the south. Now, sadly, the southern Jews would pay just as much attention to the warnings of God as the northern Jews, and that's to say none. And they, of course, fell into captivity. Now, this is where the book of Micah comes in. He himself is a man of humble background, there's really nothing about him, as we'll see, that, that just shouts to others, oh, look at me, I'm a great man of God, I'm a prophet. Uh, but he's used mightily by the Lord to proclaim his word, his inspired word. And in fact, even when Israel did not listen, um, some of Judah did. His words were remembered for generations to come. He's actually quoted in the book of Jeremiah. And of course, they're still remembered today. So the warning was given to Israel, but the message is clear to us, right? Stay humble before the mighty God. He is the exalted one. He'll exalt us in due time. Now, just by way of background, this is the sixth of what we might call the minor prophets. And if you've forgotten, then the major prophets are Isaiah through Daniel. Minor prophets start at Hosea all the way through Malachi, 12 of them in all. Book of Micah halfway through, right? Most likely authored by Micah himself. And as always, there are some liberal theologians that debate this. They argue for a much later author that lived in, you know, the time period after they came back from captivity from uh, Babylon, actually. There's really no reason to doubt. Um, Micah, of course, does write about the restoration of Israel to come, uh, but that was a common thing among all the prophets. No problem for a man who's inspired by God to write of these things that were fulfilled. In fact, as we mentioned before, uh, Malachi was, excuse me, Micah was quoted by the people of Jeremiah's day, That was certainly long before the return from Babylon because they hadn't yet been taken into Babylon at that time. So the most obvious conclusion is the simplest one, that Micah wrote the book that bears his name. Now, chronologically, Micah tells us he received his words during the reigns of kings Jotham and Ahaz and Hezekiah of Judah. And that puts us in the range, somewhere in the range of 650 to 686 B.C., 750 rather, to 686 B.C. Now, when we consider that the fall of Uh, The northern kingdom to Assyria was around 722 B.C., and that's a primary event that's in mind for Micah. That means Micah was one of the last appeals from the Lord to the northern kingdom. This is their last chance, right? And, of course, they blew it, historically speaking. Now, what does this mean to us? Uh, Considering the amount of ink that spilled on the wickedness of the wealthy towards the poor, uh, just oppression in general— It would be easy to read Micah as just an indictment of selfishness and greed, and 
Actually, a lot of people read it that way. But that seems to miss a bigger picture. Yes, God wants us to be compassionate towards our neighbors and especially those who are less fortunate. But the reason Israel, Samaria, engaged in such sins is because they forgot their God. And between the idolatry and the false prophecy and the ritualistic insincere worship that they had, that was really the primary reason for all the other sins of oppression. They had forgotten that they were supposed to be the people of God with God as their king. And so it's just like the book of Judges wrote about so many generations so much earlier. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. The truth was this God was supposed to be their king, and he promised that he would be. At the present, they were a rebellious people, and God declared it. He declared his judgment, but in the future, they would be ruled over by God himself. They'd be ruled over the, by the Messiah, and God would reign as a king in his kingdom. Now, this in itself, then, that's a message we still need to hear, although we're not Israel, we're not Judah, because we have a king. His name is Jesus, right? The Messiah that was foretold by Micah has come. His kingdom has already begun, although we don't yet see it in its fullness. We will one day. We don't right now. But what do we do in that meantime? Well, what they were supposed to do, act as his people. We're supposed to behave as a people of God. When we ha- walk humbly with Jesus, we act as citizens of his kingdom, and our Lord's glorified through the actions of his people. Now, just by a general outline, uh, most scholars divide the book of Micah into three sections because uh, they see three openings, uh, three sections that begin with here now. And according to that division, there are three separate messages, chapters 1 and 2, chapters 3 through 5, and chapters 6 through 7. That may indeed be how God originally gave the book or those messages to Micah. We're going to differ from that outline a little bit because um, the, thematically it divides up a little differently. There's a bit of overlap between those other sections, and some are so distinct that they seem to be separate topics altogether. So this is the outline we're going to follow tonight. We're going to look at the introduction and the indictment, and of course, they are indicted in chapters 1 through 3. We're going to see then in chapters 4 and 5, the king and his kingdom, very clearly portrayed for us there in Scripture. Then God takes them to court in chapter 6. He has contention with Israel, and then chapter 7 wraps it up. There's, of course, uh, conclusions, but some confessions from Israel. All right, so we'll jump it out here with the introduction and indictment. Just chapter 1, verse 1, the superscript. Uh, we'll go ahead and read it. The word of the Lord that came to Micah of Moresheth in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Very, very straightforward. Now, one thing that's not mentioned here is any mention of uh, Micah's family background. We do read of his hometown. His hometown, Moresheth, you can see it right in the southern part, southwest part of Judah. Uh, That's where they think it was, at least. They're they're not exactly sure, but they're pretty certain that's where it is. Um, Now, what makes this so interesting, he does, of course, write to the north and the south, but most of his message applies to the north. So he's a southern prophet writing to northern people. The kings he lists, actually, here are Jewish kings, not Samaritan kings. His hometown was a Jewish town southwest of Jerusalem. He's not a priest. He's not on the royal court. He's no one of a royal appointment or reputation. Just a small town guy uh, living in a lonely world, so to speak, right? Just a small town guy. (laughs) Nothing significant about him. There was one thing that was significant about him, though. Look at what it says. The word of the Lord. Very first words we read. If Micah's reputation was insignificant, the message he carried was anything but Micah had been given a word from God, and that changed his entire life. Now, I would suggest something similar could be said of any one of us, because we may not have had the grandest of reputation, pedigrees, education, but we have the word of God. We've been entrusted with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that's the most important message in all history. So we might feel insignificant, but our message is not. And we, like Micah, ought to be bold with it, because it's worth being bold about. All right, that, that's just the introduction. Um, goes into a proclamation of judgment. Again, chapter 1, verse 1, specifies Samaria and Jerusalem, capital cities of the north and the south, as a subject of his prophecy. Samaria is going to bear the brunt of these things more than anything else. But really, verse 2 begins with a call out to the entire world. All peoples everywhere are called upon to hear the Lord's witness against them. We see in verse 2, 
God had a judgment plan for the world. The world was supposed to pay attention, and God called the world, including us, right, the whole world, to the carpet. In other words, it wasn't just Israel's sins that God saw and condemned. One day, all peoples everywhere will face his judgment, something that the New Testament makes abundantly clear for us. Now, what Micah pictured here in that judgment is the incredible personal move of God himself. You start reading through that description the prophet's looking forward to the end of the age, and God visibly comes in judgment. Uh, much of this, of course, we'll see in the day of Jesus' glorious second coming. And Micah writes of mountains melting, valleys splitting, 1 verse 4. This terrible display of the, the power of Almighty God. And who's going to be able to stand in that day? They see Jesus coming in all of his glory, and you just kind of crumble at that time. Well, he also writes the reason for that move. Look at 1 verse 5. This is for the transgression of Jacob. The sins of his people, Jacob, including both the northern and southern kingdoms, they're so great that God rose up in judgment against them, against them, called all the nations to attention. But look how God is acting against his own people. So all the world is going to take notice of this. You say, wait a second. If God's moving in that way against his people, I thought God loved his people. God does love his people, immeasurably so. Yet his love for Israel, as we've said before, does not mean that God won't judge Israel. We certainly saw it historically in terms of the Assyrians. We saw it in terms of the Babylonians. We'll see it again when uh, he lets Israel endure the days of the Great Tribulation. In fact, it will be the horribleness of those days, that horrendousness, that will be the very thing that humbles Israel enough for them to finally put their faith in Christ. There's a reason why the Bible calls it the day of Jacob's trouble. In other words, God loves his people so much that he's willing to discipline them. And he's going to discipline them just harshly enough for them to get the message. And as the New Testament makes clear, especially in the book of Hebrews, God will do something similar with us as well when we engage in habitual sin. You know, when we get in that kind of sin, God sometimes allows terrible consequences to enter our lives. But it doesn't mean that he stopped loving us. On the contrary, he's allowing us to experience whatever it is we need to experience for us to humble ourselves and repentance. And that's an act of love. Now, tough love, but it's love nonetheless. Now, in verses 6 and 7, God specifically turns his attention to Samaria as opposed to both the northern and southern kingdoms. And so now the, the, the Assyrian judgment, that near judgment, seems to be in view. So the, the land's going to be overrun, it's going to be overturned. The spiritual harlotry of the land is finally going to lay desolate, as we see in verse 7. So that's how it all opens up. Micah mourns over this, starting in verse 8. As a result of all this, he's grieving for his northern brethren. He wails, he howls, and even says that he's going to walk around naked as a witness against them. Now, that's a bit extreme, perhaps. <laughs> You're not going to see too many prophets today doing that. And if you would, you'd probably you know, call the authorities to help get them some help. Uh, but it is a very visual picture of the, the humiliation that awaited the Samaritans. God would likewise be stripping the people of their dignity as they're conquered by the Assyrians. Now, the same fate would come near to Judah, as you see in verse 9. It comes near to the very gate of Jerusalem. This call to mornings passed from town to town, and this whole list of towns from verses 10 through 16. Those are all southern towns in in Judah. So it, this news is going everywhere. The Jews are going to mourn for their countrymen. And of course, if they knew what God was going to allow to happen to them, they would mourn for themselves as well. And in fact, as we read in verse 13 about Lachish, uh, this is coming to Lachish. Historically speaking, the Assyrians did conquer Lachish. There was a, a relief that Sennacherib had made. It was on display in the Royal Museum in London for a long time. And uh, in fact, I believe it still is. Uh, bragging about how he overran Lachish. Of course, not a word is said about when he went to Jerusalem. There's a good reason for that. Because only by a miracle of God that Jerusalem survived. And, of course, the angel of the Lord killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers in a single night, according to 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 35. So, uh, anyway, the Assyrians did come in up to the very gate of Jerusalem, is what it said. Just didn't go farther than that. Ultimately, of course, we know both nations will be taken into captivity exactly as Micah writes here in verse 16. No one would escape the judgment of God. No one ever will escape the judgment of God. By the way, do we understand that even Christians don't technically escape God's judgment as if God doesn't give it? The grace of the gospel is seen, 
and the fact that Jesus stepped in and took our judgment. We were still owed judgment. J Jesus took it for us. He took it upon himself. God's judgment is still poured out. It's just poured out on Jesus and not on us. And that's what makes the good news so very, very good. All right, so he mourns, and then he proclaims a series of woes on several people, and he starts with uh, the wicked in verses t uh, 1 through 5 of chapter 2. Details the various sins of the nation. Starts with these people who devise iniquity in chapter 2, verse 1. His primary focus in this section, by the way, is going to be on the wealthy. These were people who coveted. They seized lands. They, as we see in verse 2, they oppressed other people. And in verse 3, God declares himself to be against them. He proclaims a time that the tables are going to be turned. And, you know, verses 4 and 5, the own heritage of the oppressor and the own boundaries of the oppressor is going to be taken away from them. God's going to turn the tables entirely. So those are the wicked wealthy, as some people have called it. We have the false prophets in chapters 2, 6 through 11. And God had sent true prophets to his people, Micah being one of them. Micah, by the way, was a contemporary with Isaiah and Hosea and Amos as well. So God had sent many prophets to his people, probably many that aren't even mentioned for us in the Scripture. But the people didn't want to hear the true word of God. They derided that, as we see in verse 6, as being just prattle. Uh, they didn't want that. They didn't want the true word. That didn't sound good to their ears. Instead of taking God's word to be a comfort, that's how they were intended, to you know, have things that do good to him who walks uprightly, verse 7, they wanted nothing to do with that. What did they want instead? They wanted false prophets. They desired men who walked in a false spirit, 2 verse 11. People who would prophesy lies to them. They wanted people to tell them, everything's going to be just fine. You're going to prosper. As long as they believe the word of God affirmed their prosperity, you know, all that about wine and drink, it says here, then they could go on doing whatever evil they desired, even acting as the enemy of God, as we see in verse 8. Things haven't really changed too much, have they? You might recall in Paul's final letter to Timothy, probably his final letter he ever wrote, he wrote of the time that people would, you know, who were in the church, at least sitting in church, they would act as complete pagans, loving pleasure, rather than loving God, 2 Timothy 2, 4. And likewise, it would also look for false prophets and false teachers. And in fact, we read in 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. You wonder how many Christians get caught up in the false teaching of the day today. They love to hear the promises of prosperity, but they don't want to hear sober doctrine. They want to speculate on the sensational, but they don't want to be grounded in the truth. And so many times they're just throwing their money away at false prophets, and they deride sound teaching. It's just prattle. It's just a waste of time. How we need to value the true word of God. And we don't need to guess at what it is. We don't need to have some mystical teacher where we need to pay him 20 bucks to send us some key to unlock it all for us. All we need to do is read it for ourselves. We ought, to, we ought to read it, right? So you had woe to the wealthy, woe to these false teachers. You have also crimes of the rulers. We might call it woe to the rulers, though the term isn't used here. But starting in chapter 3, he turns to the leaders of the people. Some of this are going to be included in the first two earlier groups. There were men here who had the power and the responsibility to do what was right, but they willfully ignored it. It says in verse 2, they hated the good and they loved evil. Micah describes their sin as being completely destructive to the people. They even chop up the weak in verse 3, this picture of chopping them up and using them as food for their pot and just totally devouring the poor in their midst. And so they would be judged, and that's how it ends out in chapter 3. They would face their own judgment and destruction, and although they would cry out to God, it says in verse 4, God would not hear them. Those who had been evil to others would have evil come back upon them. Even the false prophets would be judged. They had given a message of peace, it says in verse 5. They spoke peace, they chant peace, but God ensures that they would be ashamed. And God would take these things away from them, we see in verse 7. As we know, God holds us responsible, those who claim to speak in his name, and it ought to be a very sobering thing to speak in the name of the Lord. But Micah did so. Micah spoke the truth and he knew it. Look at verse 8. He writes, But truly I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord and of justice and of might to declare to Jacob his transgression, to transgression and to Israel his sin. Micah knew his message. 
Micah knew the source of his message. It wasn't something that he made up for himself. It was given to him by the Holy Spirit of God, and he as a prophet would be faithful to declare it in all of its fullness. Now, before we leave that, let's just chew on that for just a little bit, because notice what this teaches us about Scripture itself. Men uh, are often accused of, oh, how can you trust the words of the Bible? It's just a bunch of words that men wrote down. Well, men may have picked up the pens to write down the words of the Bible, but those words were not given by the power of men. They were given by the power of God. That's exactly what Micah has talked about here. Paul wrote it in uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, how all Scripture is breathed out, inspired, breathed out by God. Peter writes, 2 Peter 1.21, that holy men of God were carried along by the Holy Spirit. These are words of the Holy Spirit. We have been given literally an inspired book, not inspiring as, isn't that a beautiful thing, inspiring as it was breathed out, inspiration, right? Breathed out by God. Those words that we have are the very words of God. And that's what makes the Bible so very powerful. That's why God uses it in our lives to equip us for every good work, 2 Timothy 3, 17. That's why God uses this to pierce us to our heart, to that division between soul and spirit, Hebrew 4, 12. And we think again about those false teachers and false prophets that are so common among our culture today. This is why we ought to be so very careful. We have been given the truth. And so we don't want to exchange what we've been given for a lie, especially one that's just offered for $29.95 or whatever the, the latest price is out there. Well, anyway, because Micah, Micah possessed the truth, he declared the truth, faithful to declare it, so should we, in regards to the gospel, declare it always. But he goes on to list the sins and the crimes of Israel's rulers. And you just kind of go through the list. Verse 9, you know, they perverted equity. They abhorred justice. Verse 10, they engaged in bloodshed. Verse 11, they're bribing judges. They're bribing teachers. They're bribing prophets. Whatever they want to hear, that's what they pay him to say. And in verse 12, you know, and he's speaking to the whole house of Jacob, Israel, and Judah at this time. Micah declares that Jerusalem especially would be made a heap of ruins. Did it happen? Yes. Remember when Babylon came into Jerusalem, the entire city was destroyed. And by the time the Jews returned, 70 years later, things were so bad that they had to do what? They had to even relay the foundation for the temple. That's how much ruins the city was in. It was so bad that the city's protective wall, even by the time of Nehemiah, was still in rubble and smoke was rising from it. I mean, the entire city was destroyed. So what God declared through his prophets came true to the letter. And of course, it always, always does. Now, the good news for them is that this coming destruction wasn't the only thing that was on the prophetic radar for the house of Jacob. There was also the promise of a kingdom, and that's something that Micah goes on to write about in chapter 4, the king and the kingdom. And first, he looks at the Lord as Zion's king, starting in verse 1. We've got this incredible, clear picture of the future kingdom painted here for us. It says in verse 2, of many nations coming from all over the world to the temple of God. Described here as verse 1, the Lord's house. And they're learning directly from God as he sits there as king. And there the Lord teaches, as we see in verses 2 and 3, he teaches, he judges, he rebukes the nations. In that time, in verse 5, Israel is described as walking in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. And that day, God will bring together all who are despised, describing here the lame and the outcast. He's going to make a strong nation out of them. It says in verses 6 and 7 that he'll personally reign over them in Mount Zion. That is an amazing day that's described. That's an amazing, amazing time. And there are several things that are worthy of note here. Number one, Jerusalem's not described as being ruins any longer. Right? That's how the last chapter ended. But here it's described as being this vibrant city. And so the people of Israel, the nation of Israel, it's all restored. And that's something that's going to be described in detail later on in the chapter. Uh, secondly, the, the people of Israel are not only restored in their land, but they're restored in their faith because they're walking openly in the name of the Lord their God. This is a true faith that they have at this time, total revival. And then third, most importantly, God himself personally dwells among his people as king. He's approachable, he's available, thus he's personal. Now let's think about that for a minute because the scripture overwhelmingly affirms that God is spirit. Thus, for God to be personal and available, that means he's got to be physical. It means he has to be visible. This directly supports both the ideas of the deity of Messiah as well as the physical incarnation. First of all, and that this is a reference to the Messiah is clear because this is someone who's reigning over all Israel. And that was something that was repeatedly and clearly promised to the son of David, right? So this has to be God, who's the son of David. Here it even speaks of God Almighty using his covenant name, 
capital L-O-R-D, that's the reference to his covenant name. So there's this clear connection between the son of David and God. And secondly, the fact that God can be physically approached supports the idea here that God must have physical form, something that's only impossible for a God that is incarnate. The point, the point is that Micah's teaching of the king directly supports all of the New Testament doctrine that we know of Jesus Christ. He is indeed God. He did indeed come in the flesh. That's something that's never changed. And by the way, that's something that will never change into the eternal ages. Jesus never gives up his physical incarnation all the way into eternity. This is so clear, isn't it? It should be so obvious what's taking place. You know, one thing that can't be done from this section of Scripture is to spiritualize the kingdom of way. Some people say, oh, it's just, just picturesque of the church. No, what Micah writes here is too plain, too clear to just be a mere analogy. In what way could chapters 4, 1 through 8 picture the church? Now, the church certainly included in those future plans, but this in no way describes this current age in which we now live. This is plainly a future day. This is a future kingdom. God has a literal kingdom in mind for his people, one in which his son will personally reign as king. So that's him as king. And he does have plans for Zion. We start seeing in verses 9 through 13. Micah's attention here turns back to the present time, looks ahead to the more immediate captivity coming to Zion by way of Babylon, as we see in uh, verse 10, into Babylon you shall go, there you shall be delivered. There would soon come a time there was no king in their midst, as we see in verse 9. And in verse 11, we see how the nations are going to gather and witness how Zion is defiled. They're going to see that this is the Lord's doing. He would gather the people together for judgment. Now, as it says in verse 12, they wouldn't understand his thoughts. They wouldn't understand what God's doing in that, but it would be God's doing. It would be his will. We don't always understand the will of God either, but we can trust that he's good, right? God is good. How often? All the time and all the time, God is good. So we can trust that he's going to be doing that. Uh, chapter 5 goes on to talk about the king again, his humility and his greatness. Earlier, he had spoken of the Lord God reigning from the top of Mount Zion in all glory. Now the tone changes to one of humility. This ruler that the people awaited would come from very humble beginnings. In fact, it's affirmed that he's going to be from David's hometown. That makes sense for the son of David, doesn't it? That we come from David's own hometown, Bethlehem. Look at verse 2. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. This is the prophecy that spoke of Jesus' birthplace, specifically referenced by Matthew as being fulfilled in Jesus. Matthew 2, verse 6. This is the very scripture that was actually given to the Magi, the wise men, for them to know where to look for the child who had been born as Messiah. The Jews knew this spoke of their coming king. God had told them very specifically where to look for him. It's a bit ironic, I think, that it was Gentiles who actually went to go search him out there, not the Jews who pointed that scripture out to the wise men, but that's a different sermon altogether. But what makes Bethlehem so interesting is its humility. Because, yeah, that's a hometown of David, but that's not the city David's really known for, is it? No. Well, the Messiah would one day reign from Jerusalem. That's what David's known for. But that wouldn't be his birthplace. His hometown would be someplace far less grand. That would be Bethlehem, just a little bitty Bethlehem. But God would use those humble beginnings for his glorious purposes, as he so often does. And Micah quickly jumps ahead to that glorious purpose. And he goes from his birth in Bethlehem, jumps through time all the way to Jesus' second coming. At Bethlehem, Jesus came first, but it wouldn't be until his second coming that it says in verse 4 that he stands in the midst of Israel, feeding his flock. And it's at that time they finally understand his strength and his majesty, it says. Jesus would be known as great to the ends of the earth. Isn't that amazing how prophets do that? In one section they go from his first coming, the second section they go to his second coming, the culmination at the end of the world. Those prophetic mountain points that he's looking forward to history, it all looks the same to him, but separated by thousands of years. So that's the glory yet to come, but again, there's still this idea of judgment, something that's going to be seen in the near future, and we see that starting up really in verse 6, that latter part of verse 5, but starting in verse 6, this judgment of Israel, Samaria, comes by the hands of the Assyrians. It will be very, very fierce, but notice it won't be final. Eventually, Assyria itself would be, as it says, verse 6, laid waste with the sword, and God would deliver his people from the Assyrian armies. How does that take place? 
Well, we know historically God used the Babylonians to lay waste on the Assyrians, just like God would use the Medes and the Persians to lay waste on the Babylonians. Each of those empires, they're judged in turn, all subject to the sovereign will of God. He's the almighty God over all the nations, not just one. But in the meantime, he says that God would preserve a remnant, verse 7, a remnant of his people in the midst of many people. They would still be his people no matter where they were. As they're scattered throughout the nations, they never lose their identity as Jews. Even the northern kingdom of Israel, they still have a remnant. We even see that, by the way, in the scripture, because after the Assyrian invasion, there were at least some among that northern kingdom. There was a remnant who came down to worship God during that Passover feast that was led by Josiah. So there's always a remnant of God people. God knows among his people who have true faith, and he preserved them in the midst of all their troubles, just like he always has. And eventually it says in verse 9, there would come a day when the enemies of Israel cut off. As we see in verses 12 through 13, one day God's going to destroy all the false religions of the world. We know every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. All right, so God's going to start taking... Israel to court. He invites Israel to plead her case. He's going to plead his own case starting in verse 1 of chapter 6. It's as if God's sitting in a courtroom with Israel and, uh, okay, let's lay all these arguments on the table. God had done nothing to incite rebellion among his people. He had always acted on their behalf. And as he details in verse 4, he's the one who freed them from Egyptian slavery. He's the one who gave them prophets. He's the one who gave them priests, the people like, you know, Moses and and, and Aaron and, and uh, Miriam, he, he gave all of these people to him. He's the one in verse 5, he demonstrated his own righteousness when he delivered them from Balak and, and others. So what had God ever done to them that was evil? What did he do that caused them to rebel? And Israel answers, uh, really prophetically through Micah, with the excuse that they didn't know how to please God. What does God desire from us? Well, they don't know how. They, they couldn't bring enough offerings to you know, satisfy his wrath. You know, it would just thousands of thousands of rams. Would it be enough? If there were 10,000 rivers of blood, would it be enough? Even if I brought my own firstborn child, verse 7, would it be enough? Just a sad excuse. By the way, it's an excuse, but there is a grain of truth in it, right? Because there's only one sacrifice that can truly satisfy God's wrath against sin, and that's the sacrifice of Jesus. It doesn't matter how religious we think we're being. Acts of religion never make us right in God's sight. And you could sacrifice thousands and thousands of bulls and sheep and goats, but the blood of goats can never take away sins. We can pray repeated prayers, the same prayers over and over again. We can give a lot of money to a lot of causes. All that is ritual designed to save and all that fails to do so. The only act that saves is the act that Jesus took on our behalf when he became our sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice at the cross that later arose from the grave. We have to participate in what he has done or we really can't participate with God at all. Now that said, the people were still offering their excuses to God. They were looking to justify themselves through ritual rather than experiencing any sort of heart change. And God tells them he wants something far more sincere for them. And we sang it tonight, very famously, the most famous verse from Micah perhaps. Micah 6, 8, He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. See, the fact of the matter is that God had shown the people what he desired of them. They just didn't listen. God desired sincere worship. He desired heart change. He desired true obedience. And if the people worshipped him in the way that they ought to have worshipped him, everything that's listed here would have been done. That would have been the natural outcome. All the sins that had previously been listed, all the ways that they had pressed the poor, all the ways they had taken advantage of other people was proof to the fact that their worship was insincere all along. They had no humility of heart with God and was demonstrated in their wickedness. Now keep in mind that what Micah lists out here, do justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your God, that's not legalism. That's not legal. This is fruit. Remember when Jesus was asked to summarize the entirety of the Old Testament? He answered very, very simply, didn't he? Mark 12, oops, Mark 12, 30 through 31. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second like it is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. See, everything hangs, everything in the Old Testament hangs on those two commandments. Love God and love others. And if you do the first, guess what? The second is going to come naturally. 
If you're not doing the second, it's not likely you're doing the first either because one, the second, is fruit born out of the other. This is fruit, what Mike is talking about. If you've been walking humbly with God, all the rest would have come. How are you doing with this? You know, it's one thing for us to look at Israel's sins and to count it off and say, oh, look at all the ways they fail. But what about us? Are we walking humbly with God? Are we loving him with all that we are, with all that we have? Are we wicked towards others and really demonstrating no fruit of love in our lives? If Israel needed a heart check, so do we. We need to take an assessment, see how we're doing here. So, okay, he's taken them to court, and finally he pronounces sentence upon his people. They're found guilty. Their self-defense was woefully inadequate. Now they face the judgment of God. He knew well their sin, their violence, and their lies, as it says in chapter 6, 11, and 12. He knows all of those things. And so now God would humble them. They had not been humble with God, so he would humble them. In verse 14, he would strike them with hunger. He would strike them with the sword. Verse 15, all their crops would fail or be taken from them. Verse 16, they would bear the reproach of his people. It's a terrible but a, a just punishment. So things start to wrap up in chapter 7. Micah's misery and hope. He knows, of course, what's coming, and we would think it would be no wonder Micah lifted up his voice in anguish, yet that punishment, that's not what bothered Micah the most, interestingly enough. What bothered him was the continuing sin in the land. Look at 7 verse 2. To his eyes, it seemed that the faithful man had perished from the earth. He's asking, is there anybody righteous around? And apparently not. Even in the midst of God's proclaimed judgment, people are ignoring that, and they're still sinning, and they're as we see in this whole list in verses 3 through 6, they're still bribing, they're still scheming, they're still lying, they're still dishonoring their parents. Things are so terrible. They're working against each other, and that's what Micah grieves over. You know, it's interesting, when we look there specifically at verse 6, for son dishonors father, daughter rises against her mother, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, man's enemies are the men of his own household. That same condemnation is quoted by Jesus in quite a different context because he too would set children against their parents. And you can read in Matthew 10, 34 through 36. He said, I came to bring not peace, but a sword. He brings division of a different sort. For Israel, of course, Israel was more willing to choose sin than God. For Jesus, from his perspective, we have to be more willing to choose him even rather than our own family. Again, it goes back to this idea of loving the Lord God with all that we have and with all that we are, even if that means leaving behind old relationships, even family relationships, and so be it. We need to count the cost of what it means to follow Jesus, and that count and that cost is always worth it. Now, Mike is not completely hopeless. Yes, the land was full of iniquity and sin, but he could turn his attention to another place. Look there at 7, verse 7. Therefore, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. That's where his hope is found. When all else fails, where do we turn? We turn to the God of our salvation. We may be abandoned by the world, but God will always be our God of our salvation. His love for us never, never fails. Now, thankfully, there are a few confessions at the end. First, Israel confesses their sin. 7 verse 8 begins that. Thankfully, Israel won't always remain blind to her sin. And Micah is really writing through a prophetic voice. And he's speaking from Israel's point of view of a place they'll eventually come to, that she openly admits her transgressions against God. The nation understands that she has, quote, sinned against him. Chapter 7 verse 9, her only hope is the Lord God's going to plead her case. She'll understand his righteousness, but for now she understands that her punishment is just. And wrapped up in all of this is really a confession of faith that she has in her Lord. And we really see it coming to full bloom and starting in verse 14. Unlike times of old when Israel refused to walk humbly with God, that humility is going to be demonstrated in the future. And here Israel is shown seeking the Lord. Uh, asking him to guide them and to shepherd them, starting verse 14. Uh, trust that just as God had acted in times past in regards with Egypt, he would act in the future over all of her enemies, verses 15 and 16. And most of all, Israel understands that God's punishment did not mean that they were forever cast away because one day they would be forgiven. They knew that God is the God who pardons iniquity, verse 18. He pardons iniquity, He doesn't retain his anger forever. 
God delights in mercy and one day shower them with it. What is it that God would do? He would freely restore them. He would freely forgive them. He would freely love them. Just look at how it ends. Micah 7, verses 19 through 20. He will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will give truth to Jacob and mercy to Abraham, which you have sworn to our fathers from days of old. Isn't that awesome? You know, if you, if you would stop before then, you would think that they would just be left in their hopelessness or what do they have to look forward to except the judgment of God? And yes, there's this promise of a future kingdom, but that's so far off. How can we be assured of anything of God right now? And yet they end on such a message of faith. This is their confession of faith. Our God, we haven't forgotten his character. He is a good God. He is a merciful God. He is a loving God. He is a God who forgives. And guys, those are the same promises that we have in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our sins have been cast far from us. As the Psalms declare, Psalm 34, verse 8, as far as the east from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. We've been showered with the mercies of God. Mercy upon mercy, grace upon grace. We've been brought into those covenant promises of God through faith. That's glorious. So to wrap it up, judgment was coming, but that wasn't all. There was a revival coming. That's a good thing. People would one day confess their sins. They'd receive the forgiveness of God. They'd be restored as a people of God. One day be ruled over by the physical person of God. He'd bear their king. They'd be their people. Glorious promise. And again, this is the same promise that we enjoy as Christians because we're going to be a witness to all of this as it unfolds one day. The one thing they required to give to God in the presence, the one thing they weren't willing to give, they hadn't yet reached that place of humility. Now, one day they would, but they hadn't yet. If they had humbly walked with God, loving him with their whole heart, then God would have freely bestowed his mercy at that time. But instead, they loved their sin more than their Savior, and they experienced his discipline. So the message to us is to love God, right? To humble ourselves before him, walk with him. We want to learn the easy way, not the hard way. And so when God does bring that conviction of sin, we want to do what? Confess it, repent of it, humble ourselves, just be done with it. Do it in sincerity through Jesus Christ and by no other means. Just deal with it immediately. Our God is a good God. He's a merciful God who forgives. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this time. We thank you for our night together. I thank you for this book of Micah. Lord, thank you that you've revealed yourself to be the merciful God who freely forgives our sin and iniquity. As it says here, Lord, you delight in mercy. Father, I'm amazed as I think because other religions, they don't worship their false gods. They don't know that their God delights in mercy. But your word declares it of you, and it's true. You delight in mercy. Thank you for showering us with your mercy through Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that because of him, our sins are cast far, far, far away from us. You don't even remember them any longer. The thing that's written in your book, Lord, are not our sins, but our names in the book of life because of Jesus, because you've showered us with your mercy. You've given us your grace. So we thank you and we worship you. Oh, Lord, help us walk humbly with you. Help us walk in love with you, submitted to you, letting our lives be transformed by you. Lord, we thank you. Where we've sinned, Lord, and we've fallen short of that. Forgive us. And we know that you do based on the promises of your word. Cleanse us. Equip us to walk new. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.